Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm here for a third time with Dr. Moshe Hoffman. He is a research scientist at MIT Media Lab and lecturer at Harvard's Department of Economics and I will be leaving links in the description box for our first two interviews. So Dr. Hoffman, thank you again for taking the time to come on the show. It's always a pleasure to everyone. Yeah, th thanks for having me. Okay, so I think that we've already touched on this topic in our two previous interviews, but just to get this straight, because uh, the the two the other two times we talked about uh, evolutionary psychology and the kinds of behavior that it it can explain, and also where game theory gets into the picture and where. Uh, and the kinds of behaviors where we have to get more into proximate explanations for for us to understand them better as they are. So where do social incentives, because incentives are one of the main topics in game theory, where do social incentives come from? Do you think that they have a big innate basis or do you think that we can explain them completely through game theory? What do you think? Well, I, I, I don't think game theory explains our, our, our social incentives. I think, I think um, for many applications, uh, like the applications I think of, social incentives are kind of like the inputs into game theory. Um, so, so game theory kind of translates the social incentives into interesting, uh, uh, otherwise puzzling behaviors. Um, and and so, so game theory kind of does that mapping for you, but it takes as input social incentives and, and it, it gives you as output like weird or odd behaviors. Um, but, but it can't explain the social incentives so much as, as um, tells you what implications they have. I, I think to explain the, the social incentives, um, so m maybe it helps if we're a little bit concrete by social incentives. I mean, I have in mind, maybe, maybe you have something different in mind. Um, Things like, uh, you know, my desire to, to be liked or, or, or find a romantic partner um, or, or, or to have a, a, a legacy after I, I, I die um, or, or um, uh, things like this. Um, so, so I think of those as inputs. Game theory can tell us interesting implications that those might have or how those, you know, my desire to have those things, how they combine with other people's desire to have other similar things to give odd implications. But, um, but, but Obviously, uh, these desires uh, have to come from somewhere, and that somewhere uh, can only be um, uh, uh, um, biological e evolution. Or, well, maybe I shouldn't say can only be. I think of them uh, as, as coming from there, and I take the things that are evolved interests uh, like those things and, and take them as inputs into game theory. But, but, but let me also just clarify that, that these things aren't quite the same as like biological fitness. Um, in that I, I do think once we've evolved these kind of social incentives, um, we often pursue them even when they don't correspond with fitness. So I might, I might want to be high status even if um, I'm no longer able to reproduce. Um, I might still uh, pursue uh, um, uh, a high status job uh, um, even if it can't lead to, to more reproductive success. I, I, uh, um, I, I might also pursue uh, romantic partners even when, you know, we're both using birth control. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think the, the, the desires evolve because they, they correspond and the social incentives or what I'm calling social incentives evolve because of their correspondence in our evolutionary past with biological fitness that, that need not be the same as if I were to actually pursue biological fitness in, in my day-to-day -day life. I, I'm, I'm instead pursuing these things uh, that, that kind of took on a life of their own, um, uh, like, like uh, legacy and, and, and reputations and mating. Mm -hmm. But uh, so do you think that social incentives are come mostly from a biological basis or do you think that at least some of them are culturally acquired, let's say? So, so uh, another thing that I often um, differentiate between is like... Um, I guess what people in the reinforcement learning literature might refer to as primary uh, rewards and, and secondary. Um, and, and when I think of social incentives, I, I think of like the, the primary things that 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 we evolved to like and that are 
innately liked. And, and, and then I think that they can also shape other things like secondary uh, uh, incentives, things that we kind of uh, develop a liking for. And, and I try to distinguish them. Uh, um, uh, it's important to kind of keep track of the things that like we started off liking and shaped the other things that we like and the things that we have learned to like. Um, so, so I think of reputations, legacy, uh, you, you know, mating opportunities. These are things that we evolved to like uh, and that shape other things that we like. But then there are other things that I might have learned to like. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, I might like a, a stamp collection. Uh, that I have, and, and I might put a lot of effort and, and money into developing a stamp collection. Um, but that's something that, like, I wasn't born liking. Like, like there, 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 there's nothing innate about about liking stamps. I, I had to kind of develop that taste, um, and I presumably developed it because it's a, of its association with something that was a more primary taste, like like the fact that it, you know, uh, my friends thought it was cool, uh, or uh, people might have thought that I was, you know, interesting, or 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 or, 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 or something else because of this connection. Uh, collection and, and so 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 that causes me to kind of develop this kind of what I would call it a secondary taste um and, and I think the social sciences don't usually um you know distinguish between these two they just talk about like the things we want or the preferences we have but I think of them as like fundamentally d distinct in that like uh, you know maps onto kind of this proximate ultimate distinction to some extent which is like um, you know the secondary things that we've learned to like are in some sense proximate because they're, they're endogenous. You can you can learn to like them that that requires some explanation of why you like them, and you maybe only like them in some circumstances or to some extent. And you can learn to unlike them. So so if all my friends start thinking stamps are like so old school, um, and, and everybody thinks that I'm like a complete dweeb for liking stamps, you know, eventually I'll stop paying attention to my stamp collection and, and it'll dwindle and, 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 and I'll, you know, I'll lose that taste. And, and, and so, so those tastes that are secondary are also ones that like are very much malleable and very much endogenous and, and, and um, they ought to be treated very differently from the primary taste that, 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 that shape them. And I and my research tend to try to understand the secondary taste, but, but I use the, the primary taste to do that. Um, and and I, I try very hard to keep them distinguished uh, in, in my mind. Mm -hmm. So the secondary incentives or tastes derived from the primary ones, but we can only understand them uh, completely if we know the social or cultural context where they develop. Right? Yeah, that's right. And so I tend to think of those things as like the puzzling things that need explaining. And I use things like primary rewards, uh, including social incentives, with the help of mathematical tools like game theory to understand how, how the secondary stuff works. Um, whereas a lot of the, the, the um, l let me distinguish that a little bit from like uh, other social sciences, which, which, which tend to kind of treat the secondary stuff as explanations in themselves. And then to distinguish slightly from, from a more traditional evolutionary psych approach, um, uh, you might instead try to, uh, uh, um, if you take that approach, might instead try to trace back these things that we uh, that, that we like, including the secondary stuff, to uh, all the way back to uh, you know evolutionary considerations like, like biological fitness. Whereas I'll tend to only try to chase it back to primary rewards um, and, and social incentives. And, and I guess my my reason for doing that is that, um, uh, like I mentioned earlier. Primary rewards aren't always the same as biological fitness, even even if that's where they, they, they came from, um, b because you know sometimes we pursue them you know uh, for their own sake when they're no longer um, as related to biological fitness as they originally were, and, and because the the, um, the 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 relationship between the two, how primary shapes secondary, is often at like a, a, a the time scale of like individual learning and not not biological evolution, uh, and so it's kind of a, a different time scale and a different adaptive process. Um, uh, that's that's how I tend to think about these kind of things. Mm -hmm. So, do you agree that if, if in two different societies we find people behaving in different ways, there can still be th those different ways can still be based on the same underlying cognitive mechanism that we've evolved? I mean, for example, if in one society someone collects stamps and in another society someone collects, uh, I, I don't know, shells, seashells, sea for example. Uh, I mean, the overt behaviors are different, but the underlying cognitive mechanism could be the same. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think it could be, but but I, I guess I also just want to clarify that it somewhat depends on your question. So I tend to focus on the questions that I will explain by thinking about the primary rewards uh, 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 and, and, and and like social incentives. But um, uh, uh, um, you know, for for other questions that that need not necessarily be the the, the best toolkit. Um, and, and and this toolkit tends to kind of abstract away from like the cognitive machinery at play. Um, and, and for some questions, it's really important to know like the detailed cognitive machinery at play, um, which might not, uh, you know, be the same between seashells and stamps. Um, uh, for the kinds of questions that I'm thinking about, it, it, it tends to be uh, the cognitive machinery tends to not be terribly relevant, uh, you know. So I don't focus on that. But but I don't mean to say that that it's never particularly relevant. Um, and uh, um, so, so there are very, very specialized, you know, mental modules that deal with very, very particular problems that that uh, uh, um, uh, might not generalize to every problem that deals with that same kind of, you know, primary reward. But that just happens to be the kind of um, uh, then then my toolkit won't do a good job at that. Um, and, and and something like a mental module approach would be better. And, and maybe you know, uh, similarly. Um, others have pointed out that, that a lot of our cognitive machinery uh, is not only biologically evolved, but is, is highly sensitive to to, um, uh, to the culture that we're in. So, uh, you know, I think you've had Joe Henrik on here before, um, um, and you know, he talks a lot about, and he's got this forthcoming, or maybe it's, it's recently come out, a book that talks a lot about how, um, for instance, Western culture, our, our history of the past two thousand years, um, has very much shaped our minds. Um, Including, you know, our cognitive machinery to, to think very differently than, than we would in, in other cultures. Um, and, and so, uh, um, you know, in that sense, maybe the way that we think about stamps might be very different than the way that, that uh, a non-Western culture would think about seashells or, 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 or uh, 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 um, a small scale society might, might think about seashells. And so, so, uh, so um, you know, Mental modules or cultural evolution are important tools, but uh, yeah, my approach, where I focus kind of on primary rewards, is going to abstract away from those toolkits um, for the most part and, and miss some insights that they get, um, but hone in more on how much can you get by just thinking about primary rewards with the help of game theory. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the basic information processing mechanism that occurs at the level of the brain, uh, I mean, we, you, within game theory or, or people in general, or at least you in specific, are not interested in that kind of thing? Or are there instances where you think that through a game theoretical approach uh, there are some, I don't know, mechanisms that can change the information processing mechanism itself and make it work or function in a different way. You have an example in mind or you're just kind of asking in the, in, in the abstract possibilities? Uh, I, I was just asking in the, an abstract possibility because, I, I mean, I... I there's yeah. nothing specific that is coming to my mind at the moment, but I was just generally asking if uh, through uh, there are some instances in game theory that you think there are things that people might acquire, for example, from their culture or there might le they might learn that through game theoretical approaches would... Uh, we would conclude that the basic information processing mechanism that deals with that kind of information uh, was modified in certain yeah. ways. Yeah. So, so game theory models, um, in general, kind of take as inputs um, the, the the information structure. So, what information every actor might have uh, available to them. And uh, you know a, a set of available actions, uh, things that, that that each player can do. Uh, uh, um, you know, more complicated models. You might have sequences of actions and, and, and signals that players can send, and, and and ways that they can react to each other and stuff. But but you know, it's basically actions, uh, information, and then incentives. Those are kind of like the three inputs. Um, and and uh, so the incentives that each of the players face um, as as a as a function of what everybody does. And uh, the, uh, which might be what they expect to be the best action might be affected by, by the kind of information that, that each of them have. Um, so that's kind of the inputs of these models. And, and uh, you know, the, the 
two basic tweaks that I do to interpret game theory for, for my purposes is incentives. I'm always going to interpret them as, as uh, uh, you can't see my hand, I guess. Um, I'm always going to interpret them as, as, as primary rewards. Um, so, so, so not just like financial incentives, not just like the things that we consciously pursue, but, but the things that, um, uh, you know, the things like the social incentives I described before, uh, like, you know, are, are not necessarily conscious desires to have mates or a good reputation or, or, or avoid social exclusion. Um, um, and, and of course some, some not necessarily social incentives as well, like the desire for food or other material resources, uh, shelter. Um, and so, so those would be kind of that'll replace incentives in the way that economists usually think of them. And then, and then uh, like other evolutionary minded people, uh, I won't assume that people are kind of consciously, rationally, like calculating what's optimal to do. I'll assume that evolution or learning processes do that optimization for them. And it's kind of an as if model that like, you know, on average, in the long run, people will tend to, you know, reach, reach the optimum um, uh, with respect to these primary rewards, given the information they've available to them. Um, so, so that's kind of the way that I think about game theory, but, but to be clear, there's like some built-in um, assumptions there, which is uh, about like our cognitive abilities. Now, in the traditional model, the built-in assumption will be that like we're, we're capable of like doing very, very complicated, like abstract reasoning in our conscious minds. Um, and, uh, um, you know, high order belief, me calculating what I think other people think that I think, and, you know, this kind of stuff, which there's a lot of good evidence that people aren't great at this. Um, uh, um, uh, but, but for my purposes, I, I guess I only require evolution or learning processes can respond to information and, and, and can optimize it, uh, according to, to the incentive structure of the primary rewards. I, I don't necessarily require that people, like, the conscious, um, consciously able to do these calculations, just that the processes are able to. But but they do have to kind of have the cognitive machinery to um, uh, uh, to to at least uh, you know um, access this information at some level, not necessarily really consciously to to respond to it at some level to to categorize to to, to search. You know, so so there's kind of certain like very very base assumptions that you need an agent to be able to do to kind of reach optimum and be responsive to information. Um, and, and I just kind of will assume that they can. And, and, and uh, um, yeah, that's, that's an assumption. Uh, um, and, and maybe in some context that's, that's harder uh, than, than others, but, but I kind of will, will just presume it. And I'll think of the, the main thing that's constraining them is what information is actually available, not what information can their, their brains process. Um, and I, but I, I think that the cognitive questions of like, what can we, process tend to be more interesting if you if you care more about like the conscious uh, form of optimization than if you think about the optimization is happening at an evolutionary or, or learning time scale because when, when it's happening at those time scales it's, it's kind of we're less constrained by what our brains can 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 do um, uh, um, you know you don't you don't need to be uber rational to um, to, to, to reach Nash equilibrium if, if evolution and learning can kind of uh, uh, slowly adjust in the right directions. Uh, th it turns out that takes very little amount of, of rationality. Mm -hmm. Yes, and in economics specifically, people make the distinction between stated preferences and revealed preferences. Stated preferences are basically when we ask people about a particular preference, what they say they like, and revealed preferences would be, for example, putting people in a situation where they have to make a choice and then we observe and analyze their behavior to reveal their preferences. So do you think that w these are two different levels of analysis and one is more revealing than the other? One is best for us to, n to understand a particular kind of social behavior or that we need both to, to do it? Well, I mean, I think oftentimes it's it's interesting to to understand why people state the preferences that they that they they proclaim they have. Um, but I think if we want to understand people's actual behavior, uh, like economists have noted, it's better to look at, at the real preferences. Uh, um, uh, I think that that's right. I, uh, um, uh, with that said, I also think that many economists wrongly um, construe reveal preferences. In in a um, 
and maybe you wanted to, 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 to get into this more later, but in terms of like the secondary uh, uh, incentives or secondary preferences that we talked about, which is they'll often describe people's uh, preferences in terms of, you know, I like stamps if I have a stamp collection. And I think that, that that's got some benefits uh, um, to analyzing people's preferences in terms of like the secondary preferences that they currently hold, but that's going to be highly misleading if my liking of stamps is, um, you, you know, changes depending on what my social circle likes. Um, uh, then, you know, putting into my utility function, uh, uh, you know, a term for, for stamps uh, isn't going to, isn't going to capture how that's going to change when my, you know, depending on what it does to like my social esteem or, 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 or my, my, my status or things like that. And so I would rather uh, put in things like status and social esteem and get my liking of stamp collection as an output than putting it as a, an input at, um, into, you know, my analysis. And then the other thing that, that you're going to kind of misconstrue if you take stamp collection, uh, liking of stamps is like a, an assumption about my preferences, you'll have no way to explain why some people like stamps, um, uh, um, which is kind of like the main puzzle to begin with. So oftentimes kind of uh, econ models, which, which take people's preferences given, take as given the very thing that's puzzling. Um, and sometimes not. So if you assume people, you know, want more money and, uh, you know, more happiness or things like that, you know, you're not, that's, those are like pretty mundane assumptions. But when you start assuming things like, um, um, you know, I might have a, a, a preference for, for stamps or something very concrete like that, which you often have in the behavioral econ literature, then it becomes more odd to like assume the thing that's, that's puzzling. Um, um, it's better, in my opinion, to put in something like, I like status, and that gives you um, as an output that I like stamps in some circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you think that uh, stated preferences by themselves can give us uh, relevant information about uh, how people think at least or the culture they are part of? Because, for example, uh, last February or March I interviewed an anthropologist, Dr. Edward Fisher, and he has a very interesting take on the distinction between stated and revealed preferences and he gives the example of uh, people in Germany who, for example, when they are asked uh, about buying eggs, they say that uh, they prefer buying organic eggs, the, the ones that are more uh, cruelty free, let's say the free ranging, uh, the eggs that come from free ranging chickens. But then uh, when people look into the data, the biggest percentage of people buy uh, normal eggs. I mean, eggs that come from non-free ranging chickens. So, uh, but he says that the stated preference still has some value because uh, people don't buy the free ranging chicken eggs because they are more expensive and so in an ideal situation they would do so but since they can't afford them that's the reason why they don't do it so the does this what do you think about this yeah yeah i think that there's uh, some, some truth to it um i i do think there's still information contained in stated preferences um, uh, and revealed preferences have their limitation in that that you can only see what's been revealed, um, and, and, and you know there's a limitation to, to like what the behavioral evidence is able to show. Um, um, it's not immediately obvious to me that like the reason why stated differs from revealed always has to do with just cost. There could be other reasons my, why I might misrepresent um, my, my my preferences uh, uh, when I state them. Um, or why not might not have conscious access to my to my preferences, um, but but I I, 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 I I agree that at least in, in some occasions it's just because it's too costly, um, um, uh, 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 and, and maybe also I, I want to uh, you know oversell how insensitive I am to cost, so I might want to present myself as all I care about is uh, you know animal welfare when really uh, I care about that relatively little. Um, and, and I'm not willing to pay a high cost for it. Um, a few other ways in which I think that stated preferences might be informative is one is one of the odd things that people do is, is, is talk a lot. We, we have all sorts of rhetoric and justifications and arguments 
And I, I think that that's like an inherently interesting part of human behavior that's that's worthy of, of study and understanding. Um, uh, as well as like, you know, our, our whole, you know, conscious experience, like how do we think about our lives and our behavior? That's also something that's kind of fundamentally interesting and worthy of understanding. Um, and, and so, so I, I take these as kind of like fundamental puzzles worthy of explaining to the extent that our stated preferences don't match uh, our, our, our revealed preferences. Uh, um, it, it's worth knowing why we're, we're stating these things. Um, and, and that's, that's often um, uh, interesting uh, 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 in its own right. I, I guess maybe another thing is that, um, uh, and maybe, maybe related to, to um, your previous interviewer's uh, point, about, about low cost is that, that sometimes um, stated preferences uh, uh, um, can impact my behavior, particularly when they end up having lower cost in the future, but the mere act of stating them can, can matter. Um, uh, so, so, you know, one example that I, I often give is like, um, well, well let, let me throw a few at you. I, in our class, we often uh, start talking about how primary rewards shape our ideologies and, and one of the first like problem sets we give to the students is we have them read um, a, a few chapters and excerpts from uh, American Revolutions, which is a very nice um, uh, text on on uh, the, the American Revolutionary War that, that does things from a pretty objective perspective and it, it kind of highlights a lot of the um, in, in incentives that were at play in, in driving uh, the, the colonists, especially the founding fathers, to want to rebel from the British. And so one of the things we, we, we try to do there is kind of tease apart how their ideolo ideological justifications for rebelling uh, and their notions of like liberty and freedom might have been heavily biased by, by their own, uh, in this case, fairly, you know, uh, uh, material and financial interests. Uh, um, and and so, so, so we kind of walked them through those arguments. And, and, but, but the conclusion is that like, you know, our ideologies about liberty and, and equality are heavily, you know, malleable and, and shaped by by what we have like a need to justify and, and what kinds of things we want to promote, uh, and, and they're, they're shaped by incentives. But um, that doesn't mean that that once we say these arguments, it has no effect. So once once the founding fathers espouse liberty and equality and put them into, you know, our, our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution, they ended up uh, um, mattering. One, it, it made it very hard to not have a democratic government afterwards. So, so they kind of bound their hands. And then when, you know, Thomas Paine writes his pamphlet afterwards, uh, uh, that, that's much more populist that, than the founding fathers wanted, the founding fathers were kind of stuck giving people uh, a little bit more, more rights uh, and more equality and, and distributing the resources a little bit more evenly after the, the Revolutionary War. And then, you know, in the long run, uh, you know, you had, you know, uh, um, Frederick Douglass come around uh, um, who, who starts saying, well, you have all these like lines in your constitution, maybe they should apply to black people too. Um, and, and it makes it kind of harder to argue uh, against him when you've already kind of espoused these arguments in the past as justifications for yourself. And, and I think that that's part of, if not the main reason why abolition was able to, to kind of get off the ground and the same thing with like women's suffrage and, and things like that is because we had already kind of espoused these ideals as justifications earlier, you, you would take kind of a, a, an inconsistency hit uh, and look like you're not actually driven by these principles if you don't follow through on them uh, um, later on. And, and so, so what you espoused earlier can, can kind of bind you a little bit uh, later, especially when the costs are low. Um, so maybe it wasn't enough to make the, the southerners whose whole economy depended on slavery become abolitionists, but the northerners who have much less of a financial stake in it, um, it, it might it might cause them to, to be more into um, a, a, a abolition. Um, a, and so um, what you espouse can matter uh, um, uh, for because of like consistency motives um, when the costs are low. That's uh, um, yeah. if, if you want another example, I can yeah, we can move on also. Uh, yeah, but since you've already introduced the topic of historical discourse that I had a question for later, but maybe I will uh, introduce it now. So you mentioned, for example, the American Revolution and uh, you have a Twitter thread that I will leave in the description box of the interview uh, where you say, where you talk about historical discourse and the first tweet is historical discourse and discourse surrounding current 
recent events often conflate justifications with causes. So could you tell us, and perhaps now you can give us the second example, could you tell us what, what you mean by this, that sometimes what people identify as causes per, yeah. be, behind a particular historical event are only justifications and not really the causes of it? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, I, the American Revolution example already kind of like um, uh, hints at that. So let me let me go back to that, and if you want more examples afterwards, I, I can go into more examples. Yeah. Um, but but there, um, you know, there's two kind of possible ways to to interpret our our ideological justifications for revolting. One is that those ideologies, like our notion of liberty and equality, um, uh, came kind of um, uh, because people had read, you, you know, uh, Locke or other Enlightenment thinkers, they developed these ideas, and that that made them uh, feel compelled intellectually um, to espouse these ideas and, and to fight for them, and that's why uh, they revolted. So that's kind of their like ideologies as cause, beliefs as cause model of of how history might work, and I, I think m more or less different historians kind of. Um, uh, espouse these views. I mean, usually they also recognize that there are material interests at play, and and they kind of both matter. And maybe maybe there'll be some disagreement among historians how much one matters relative to the other. Or, or uh, um, uh, um, uh, and and a lot of good research uh, comes about because people try to try to show. Look, they really believed in equality and liberty. Here are some private letters that show they really believed in it, and that that really enraged them uh, and really motivated people to act. And others will say, well, look, here's some land speculation that was going on, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, some insider trading that was going on. And, uh, you know, here's the huge financial stake that this founding father had in, in, in supporting the rebellion. And, and, and that both those are, are, are good scholarship, good research. It's good to kind of document and understand those those things. But uh, in that in that model is kind of like the both causes. Um, the ideologies, the beliefs are causal, the material incentives are causal, and, and of course many things are multiply causally determined, so, so they're both kind of inputs into shaping history. And I, I think that that's broadly how, how most historians um, will view things, and, and I think that, that uh, um, an, an alternative um, it, uh, is that, well, um, a lot of the material interests shape what we believe and which ideologies we accept and, and how we might uh, uh, distort or, or conceive of those ideologies. So it's not that there are two independent causes, it's that, that this cause uh, uh, will shape this. And so this isn't really acting as, as an independent cause, uh, it's just kind of acting as a, as a mediator. The ideologies and beliefs are just kind of the mechanism by which the incentives, one of the mechanisms by which incentives shape our behavior uh, is through the kind of arguments that we find compelling and, and, and convey to others. Um, and um, so, so, you know, how would you tease this story apart from, from the independent cause story? Well, one is you can ask, um, is it is it the case that the people who revolted are just the people who are like most exposed to enlightenment thought, um, uh, or or is it the people who believed in these ideologies were most exposed to these kind of material incentives in, in, in pushing for what those ideologies espouse? Do the ideologies happen to conform um, in an uncanny way to the material interests, and and do they do they respond uh, in an uncanny way when their material interests shift? Okay, so let me provide evidence for those three claims. Um, so one is is not every um, person in the colonies or, or every person in the British Empire equally uh, espoused these ideals. Um, uh, those in uh, who are most who are in colonies that were dependent on British protection, um, like in the Caribbean, where they really needed the British soldiers to keep down slave revolts, uh, or were most dependent on on, on Britain for for, for trade. Um, and, and protection for, from Native Americans, uh, like like in uh, 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 what was French Canada, now conquered by England, like Nova Scotia, um, they, they they were also less into uh, um, these arguments, or, or East and, and West Florida, uh, the the, the more, most southern colonies. Um, but but it's only the kind of thirteen colonies in between that that that, that were uh, most likely to espouse it. And again, there, there's. Uh, um, uh, variation within those 13 colonies. So New York, which was heavily dependent on, on English trade and, and, and somewhat more integrated in, in British 
society, they, 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 uh, uh, at least the elites in New York, they, they were um, the least, the most likely to be loyalist um, uh, uh, um, among the 13 colonies that, that in fact rebelled, as well as, you know, Catholic minorities and, and, and if I remember correctly, Quaker minorities. Um, so, 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 so you have certain groups being more or less into these ideals, and that, that happens to be the groups that have more or less financial interest in, in having a revolution. And then, you know, the people who actually are most into revolting are the, the people who are elites in the remaining colonies who are, are dependent on land speculation, uh, you know, buying up and, and reselling Indian lands, which England is trying to prevent. Um, the most interested in slavery, which which England is, is threatening to curtail. Um, and um, uh, into smuggling like, like Hancock, which is, you know, uh, very much threatened by, by you know, the recent tea tax and, and, and things like this, which is a tax only on, 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 on foreign tea, not, not the, the, the um, uh, British East Indy tea, if I remember uh, the company correctly. Um, and um, so, so, okay, the people with most financial stake, the, they become the founding fathers. Um, and and you have the sons of liberty going around, you know, you know, which are are pressuring people um, through, through violence to to kind of support this cause, and they're being funded by people like like, like uh, Hancock. Um, and, and and so you know, you could see these kind of financial interests shaping the ideologies. You can see them only shaping it in some colonies and not others, and, and more so for some people and not other people. And then you see the ideologies kind of you know contort depending on the financial interest. So, you know, they're espousing for, for liberty and equality, but but again, a notion of liberty and equality that exactly matches what they want. So so uh, equal uh, doesn't include the black people that they're trying to enslave. Um, liberty, what they mean is the liberty to hold black people as slaves. Uh, they don't mean liberty in, in any way near, near the sense that you and me mean liberty. So, so they're contorting these words to their needs. Um, and in a way that like nobody or fewer people in, in England buy, they're like, wait, you're kind of, contorting this language. You're, you're taking these philosophers that we believe in, like, like you know, Mill and, and, and Locke, but, but, but you're, or maybe Mill was later, um, uh, 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 but, but you're, you're, you're changing the meaning. Um, and, um, and then I, uh, um, and then also as time goes on, like the, the arguments change. So, so for instance, under the, um, uh, before the, the tea tax, you have the, the stamp tax, where uh, w what England is, is taxing is like, you know, documents uh, within the colonies, uh, um, including like legal documents and, and newspapers. Uh, they have to have a stamp on them and the stamp cost uh, is taxed. So that's the stamp tax. And, and the, the argument in the colonies is that's taxing internal trade, which goes against legal precedent. Um, uh, historically, they'd only had taxes imposed on uh, uh, um, trade between England uh, uh, or, or, and the colonies or, or trade coming into the colonies from elsewhere. So, um, so it's an external tax. It's a tax on, on, on goods coming in and out, but not an internal tax. It's not a tax on things happening within their society. So that's seen, I mean, between you and me, that's a fairly arbitrary distinction. But, but that's the argument, the best argument they could come up with. Nothing that anybody in England, as far as I know, bought or had used before as an argument. But that, that was the way of justifying why the stamp tax was um, uh, 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 illegal or, or went against legal precedent. Um, but of course, the stamp tax was removed and replaced later with a tea tax. The tea tax is a tax on tea coming in to the harbors. Um, uh, so it's not internal trade. It's, it's, it's now external again. So their old argument shouldn't apply. And that's when they started coming up with, with arguments like, like no taxation without representation, the, the arguments that, that we now remember. Um, but, you know, so, so the, the ideological justifications that they deeply felt uh, changed depending on, on what they needed to justify. And so, okay, it's this kind of evidence that I've just presented to you that, that makes me think that, like, yes, the colonists really, really believed in these ideologies. They really, really believed in the arguments that they made, as many, you know, private letters and, and, and very, like, deeply felt speeches uh, 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 um, uh, convey. They, um, it, it, seems, uh, it, it seems odd to treat these ideologies as causal because of how much they were shaped by these material interests. Um, and, and, and so I think that that's kind of a common mistake that's done in history is, is like, just because something is deeply felt uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it's independent cause, and, and this is this is kind of a, a, a counter example. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, let, let us just take one step back now, and since we were talking earlier about stated versus revealed preferences, I wanted to ask you if uh, in game theory and economics more generally, what people say uh, 
uh, that is their stated preferences really do usually translate into their manifest behavior and so that would be the rebuild preferences i mean is that often the case or is it rather the case that m most of the time what people say does not correspond to their actual behavior um well i guess it depends on whether or not i have like an incentive to to uh, to to mislead or or to, or to justify. Um, you know, if you ask me uh, what I want for dinner and, and you're offering to cook me dinner, I don't. All else equal, I don't have a reason to misrepresent my preferences. It, you know, if I'm in the mood for for, for steak uh, in, instead of salmon, I'll, I'll tell you that um, because then then I end up getting the meal that I want. But but uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know how common those cases are compared to cases where. Um, you know, if, I, if I'm trying to, to, to date you, uh, I, and now I want, uh, I, I don't necessarily want you to know what, what I, I like, but, but instead to think very highly of me as like a romantic partner, then I might, you know, have much more of an incentive to mislead you. I might want you to think I'm more interested in long-term relationships than I actually am, or, or I'm more into you than I actually am, or, or, or I'm easier going or, 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 or kinder than I actually am. And, and so, so, in all, you know, so how often is one case versus another, I guess it depends on your domain and I don't have a good measure over that. But um, um, uh, when, we have, when we have an interest in, in persuading others or, or mis misleading others, uh, th then I'd be much more skeptical of, of stated preferences. Um, and and um, when it comes to like things like ideologies, uh, I, I think it's almost all about like justifying it and, and persuading. So, so uh, I think most of that is kind of, um, you know, just stated preferences or just stated beliefs and not actually deeply held beliefs. Um, uh, unless, like we talked about before, if the costs become minuscule, then you might still act according to them. Um, uh, yeah, but, uh, and likewise with, uh, with other preferences, like, you know, the fact that I want to do what's good for the world or, or do what's good for democracy or for my country. Um, uh, I, 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 uh, I, I, I that's, I think a lot of evidence suggests that, that for the most part, uh, uh, people people say that, but uh, when you look at their behavior, that's not actually what they're optimizing. Um, uh, and that, that mostly what they're trying to do is persuade you that they're a good citizen or, 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 or a good person. Um, Mm -hmm. And that part about persuasion, maybe we can establish a bridge between that and the last topic of our conversation today, because I would like to talk with you about reason or rationality, because uh, I have here two quotes from another guest that I have on the show, Robert Burton. The, these quotes are from, if I'm not mistaken, one of his books on being certain, where he talks about illusions of certainty, illusions of confidence and things like that, that we all as human beings suffer from. And he has two quotes that really uh, put, uh, th uh, that are really good for, uh, uh, that I could, I wouldn't be able to put it in better words what the kind of reason that I'm trying to talk about here. So at a certain point he says, the underlying presumption, presumption is that each of us has an innate faculty of reason that can overcome our perceptual differences and see a problem from the optimal perspective. And then the other quote is, the idea that you have a mechanism in, your, in our mind that allows for you to arrive at objective knowledge without rigor, rigorously testing testing hypothesis empirically, reason. So, I mean, do, do you think that uh, this faculty that uh, is described in these two quotes and that Robert Burton uh, thinks that doesn't exist, I mean, that we have some, some sort of cognitive mechanism operating in our minds that allows for us to arrive at uh, objective knowledge about the world around us. Do you think that this exists, or re or what we call reason uh, serves another function? Like, for example, in the argumentative theory of reasoning proposed by Dan Sperber and Hugo Mercier, they say basically that what we call reason is just a mechanism that evolved for us to be able to justify our our actions to other people and not really to arrive at objective truth. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Uh, um, 
So, so I, I do think that um, uh, a lot of when we're reasoning when it comes to morality and, and politics and things like that is completely contorted um, uh, by persuasion motives and, and things like that. Um, so, so I very much think that like in those domains when we present ourselves as reasoning, we're often mis reasoning on purpose, we're, or if not necessarily consciously, but we're often we're often distorting logic. Um, and, and I think that that shows up a lot in those domains, um, morality, politics, self-presentation. Um, um, anytime you have like a, you know, a persuasion motive and not a strong accuracy motive. Um, uh, uh, um, with that said, uh, I, I, I think uh, uh, that it's also true that, that we have evolved mental abilities to try and decipher how the world works. Um, that's going to turn on and ramp up when, uh, especially when there's an accuracy motive. Um, but, but there's fairly good evidence that, um, I don't know if you look at like Alison Gopnik's work and, and, and Laura Schultz's work that, that little kids are, are trying really, really hard to decipher, uh, you know, statistical and causal patterns in the world around them. And, and if you look at, um, uh, um, I can't, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, Stanislaw Dehaney, um, uh, uh, um, a, a, a lot of really good work on, on like how our cognitive machinery is, is built to figure out how the world around us functions. Um, and, and, and clearly that's in general a useful thing for our brains to be able to do it. And humans seem exceptionally good at this stuff. Um, we're also in the domain of politics morality, exceptionally bad at it, because we have a motive not to be good at it, but but to be bad at it. Um, so 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 um, I, I do agree that often we're we're quite bad and, and bad in, in very biased ways that, that help us persuade. But but often we're quite uh, uh, good and capable, and, and, and uh, um, uh, we have a lot of machinery that seems to be built to to to, to do that. Um, and, and then of course I, I I very much agree with like you know Joe Henrik and people people. Uh, like him, who who say that as as a collective we're 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 even much better, and a lot of learning happens at the at the collective level. Um, so you know he gives some some great examples, which maybe he, he already covered in his interview with you about how you know when when Europeans came to Australia or or, or, or to the Americas, um, they they often couldn't survive on their own and, and made some some very uh, ridiculous goof ups that, that caused them to die because they, they lacked the, the cultural wherewithal that the, the natives had. Um, and they tried to, you know, figure out how to prepare the food using their own causal models. And it turns out the causal models weren't good enough. Um, um, uh, whereas like cultural learning is able to pick up on, on a lot of subtle things. Um, so, so both we have, I do think that, that we do have that, that try to build these causal models, but, but also often we have cultures that do, of these models without any particular brain being being able to represent it. Um, um, uh, yeah, so, so that, that's my take on this topic. I, I do think that, um, um, yeah, maybe hopefully that's, that's a clear enough answer. I don't yeah, let me just add this and perhaps this will be my final question for this interview. So uh, you mentioned that there is clear evidence that, for example, children are trying to create uh, models of the world around them and statistical inferences and things like that. But uh, is at a certain point there and mentioning Joe Henrik's work, you refer to the collective side of things. And don't you agree that in science, specifically uh, that we are good at figuring out how the world works because it's a very structured and uh, highly complexly structured uh, uh, collective enterprise and so we have all, all sorts of checks and balances like for example one example is peer-reviewed papers and so people there have to go through processes that are counterintuitive and ma many times even the knowledge itself that we produce in science 
is very much counterintuitive. Uh, we just have to think about things coming from physics, quantum mechanics, and things like that. And even uh, in social science, many of the things that many of the behaviors that we have explained, I mean, people just by themselves, just by sitting on on a chair or d doing some armchair philosophy, wouldn't be able to get there just by purely reasoning. I mean, do, don't you agree with that? That perhaps th uh, the main reason why we are so successful about figuring out how the world works comes mostly from how we uh, collectively and socially structured uh, how we do science. Yeah, uh, um, uh, I do think for the for the uh, for, if, for the uh, long-term gains in technology and science, there's no way to explain that at, at an individual cognition level. That's clearly, those are clearly uh, culturally evolved and clearly also required uh, uh, institutions that prom promoted them. Um, uh, in the case of technology, you, you need to have you need to have uh, things like patent laws. Um, you, you need to have you know working market systems that allow you to extract grants from it. Um, and in science, like you said, you need a peer review sauce, uh, uh, system. You need a society of letters. You need some kind of reputational system. Uh, uh, you need you need funding sources that also get benefits from it. So you need all sorts of institutions to kind of promote this. Uh, and obviously, for for the big gains in, in you know the, the gains that small scale societies don't have that that we do, you clearly need cultural evolution and, and the evolution of institutions. Um, no doubt about that. And, and no doubt that you know human. Uh, uh, reasoning to the extent that it could do stuff clearly can't do that. Um, um, uh, let me just add, um, th those institutions, uh, uh, you know, also uh, sometimes suck too. Um, and th they're filled with the perverse incentives or, or constraints on what they're able to, to incentivize. And so we do often get um, fairly bad science or, or you know, uh, very large pockets within scientific communities that are, that are, you know, um, uh, uh, spinning wheels or ignoring what other communities have discovered, um, uh, or, or, you know, lack of cross tech, uh, talk across communities or, you know, very, very, uh, strange assumptions that, that other communities wouldn't hold, uh, or, you know, pursuing agendas that are very politically motivated. Um, so you, you have, you know, you have a history of this kind of stuff throughout science, even, you know, you have Lysenkoism, you have eugenics, you have, um, um, you, you have politics entering and you have people's individual incentives to, to, to uh, advance in their careers and become famous entering. Um, so so you, you have perverse incentives at many levels and, and science, science as an institution, you know, isn't isn't perfect, uh, and obviously the same with you know technology and, and patents. There's perverse incentives there, um, just as well. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, would you like to add any any more thing? Would you like to make any final comment on what we've been talking about? I mean, the topics that we covered today before we go, or is that? Um, no, the, the only one thing I wanted to add was um, uh, uh, when, when we talked about like the, how good we are at reasoning, um, I, I gave my, uh, my own opinion and I guess I, 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 I wanted to caveat it with it kind of also depends on how you define reason. Um, and I was defining it as, as like the ability to like, you know, detect statistical regularities and, and, and causal, uh, causal structures and things like that. Um, I, I think that, uh, so, so you mentioned... Um, Mercier and, and Sperber, I think they're defining reasoning slightly differently. Um, where, where they, they kind of define it as like on a more meta level, which is um, you know your ability to like talk about or, or mentally represent the, the, these structures. Um, and and uh, um, they make a compelling argument that the primary role of, of that kind of meta representational ability uh, has to do with persuasion and communication and stuff like that. Um, and uh, I just kind of wanted to delineate between that point and, and the point that I was making in, uh, you know, 
we, we, I guess we have to be somewhat careful with language because uh, we might have been using the word reason somewhat differently. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for the clarification. And Dr. Hoffman, again, as last time, uh, I will be leaving links for in the description box for people to check your workout. And thank you again for taking the time to come on the show. And maybe somewhere in the future, we might be able to have another conversation. And next time, if possible, include one of your collaborators because there are still some very interesting uh, questions that you explore with your collaborators in your work that we haven't covered yet. So, yeah. Happy. Um, thanks. Always, always a pleasure, Jack. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel back in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. And to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. And I also have links to PayPal in the description box of the interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and main supporters, Karin Litzke, and Blanchett, Peruga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klimpi, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalanias, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingart, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Marco Neves, Max Belby, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spigny, Phil Cavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugney, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Felicia Stevens, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Labrant, Os Oslem Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, Sardus France, David Sloan Wilson, and the Asila Deza Araujo, my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Dr. Ian Gilligan, Sergio Quadriano, Luis Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Verge, Vega Gidi, and my executive producers, Michel Rogieski, Rosie, and James Pratt. Thank you for all.